All right, so welcome everyone and thank you all for attending today. I'm really excited that we were able to invite today's speaker, Dr. Patricia Kashian. And I was first introduced to Patty's work through a discussion with friends and colleagues about the ways in which dominant ideologies shape our understanding of the world around us. And as a mycologist studying mushrooms and other fungi, Patty's work deconstructs norms and really pushes us to think critically about the ways in which dominant forces of Western culture really limit our understanding of uh, the natural world. And Patty is currently a postdoctoral researcher and curator of fungi at the Arthur Fungarium and Krebel uh, Herbarium at Purdue University. So before we begin, I wanna take a quick moment to share our plans for an extended Q&A um, after the talk, which will take a different format than what many of us are used to for seminars. So this methodology is developed and inspired by Indigenous Studies scholar, Dr. Eve Tuck, and you can learn more about the motivations behind this Q&A format in, and method in a thread that I'm going to link into the chat right now. Okay, it's just sent. So first, um, it's our responsibility as audience members to create a positive and constructive experience by not asking violent questions. So immediately following the talk, we'll have a 10 minute, um, we'll have 10 minutes to split into breakout rooms. Um, if we're in person, this would be more of a turn to the folks around you, but we're going to try this out virtually. So in breakout rooms, I'll invite you to share any questions that you might have for Patty. Um, with the other audience members in your breakout group. So use this time um, as an opportunity to peer review your questions and test them out. And even if you don't have questions to ask, folks will need uh, others to run questions by. So I encourage you to all join the breakout rooms. And then after the 10 minutes, we'll come back together for a moderated Q&A with Patty. And I'll talk a little bit, a little more about the expectations of all this at the end of the talk. So um, please hold your questions until after the talk. All right, so without further delay, um, Patty, we are really excited to have you here with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm really flattered to be invited to speak with you all today. So um, I appreciate everyone's time and attention. Um, so yeah, that intro introduction is pretty good. Um, my name is Patty and um, I use she, her pronouns. So um, I also, uh, this work, this talk is based largely on a, a paper that I published in the journal Catalyst, Feminism Theory and Technoscience. And I do wanna name my co-author um, and good friend, Hasmik Jalakian, who um, worked with me on this, on this work. Um, so thank you all for coming. Oops. So. Yeah, so this work is oriented towards scientists, academics from the humanities and all those, any, anyone in general who sort of seeks to engage with science in a critical way um, and who are interested in how discipline, discourse sort of ripples across disciplines and various areas of, areas of life. Um, this in large part was motivated by a strong belief that scientists are both intellectually and morally obligated to understand our positioning um, in a greater landscape. So no matter how small or how narrow or you know, seemingly removed from daily life, I do think it is incumbent upon scientists to be able to reflect um, on their field philosophically and sort of crit with an ethically critical lens. Um, I do think that uh, scientists should be familiar with unconscious biases, um, not only in our interactions with our students and with our colleagues, but also um, understand how our cultural um, landscape will inf impact not only the questions we choose to investigate, but also the conclusions we draw from those questions and the ways in which we relay and apply our findings. Um, 
So I think it's also important to that end that scientists are able to at least be conversant in philosophy of science so that we can honestly be able to, you know, reckon with our faults and our limitations as human beings pursuing the use of this tool. Um, and also, you know, at the same time, defend the, you know, science against anti-intellectual and anti-scientific um, arguments, um, both kind of being both science positive and science critical. So that's sort of the background. I give this talk to a number of different groups. Um, sometimes they're very mixed in their understanding of fungi and sometimes they're just mycologists. So for the uninitiated um, into mycology, these are the particular scientific um, on, aspects of fungi that we define them based on. And um, this is on the right, the image is a fairly new, I think from 2017, um, tree of life. Um, and, you know, the fungi are clustered in the supergroup Opisthocanta, which contains fungi, animals, and am amoebae, um, which share a more recent common ancestor than with say plants or with bacteria. But I also sort of want to entertain, you know, the various ways in which fungi are seen both within science, scientific um, structure, and then also out in the world beyond science. Um, and these are kind of the different ways in which basically fungi can be understood. Um, in many ways, um, fungi are both are, you know, can be defined based on their purely scientific principles, but they also have carry with them sort of a, a legacy of cultural baggage. Um, they're often believed to be poisonous, diseased, degenerate, deadly, gross, and weird. Um, many people were, um, when I, well, certainly when I began studying mycology, people, including my, my mother, was, were a bit nervous as to why I was going down this path and thought perhaps I would become ill from exposure to these fungi and during my research and, and in general, I was confronted with many kind of puzzling looks and questions as to why this, you know, why would you study these fungi? But beyond that, um, you know, the vegetated environment that enabled the transition of animals to land and the evolution of amphibians and reptiles and birds and, you know, then mammals um, was bound to symbiotic fungi known as mycorrhizae. And we know that 90% of plants, at least 90% of plants form these associations and the myceliated landscapes um, actually sustain these cascades of biological systems. So it is very much in our human evolution um, that we kind of uh, evolved and, and in fact are somewhat indistinguishable from the life history of, of, of fungi and fu other fungal bound organisms. So you can also understand fungi as terraforming bodies that have, that are somewhat you know, trans individual, meaning that they, they connect multiple individuals at once and sort of shape shift into new forms um, and enable this like sort of interface, interface of re renewal and death um, through uh, decomposition and nutrient reall reallocation sort of taking on this whole spectrum of symbiosis. So in, in that way, we are, you know, we share a collective ecological history with these complex organisms. So these are all ways in which fungi can be understood. Of course, um, despite you know the, that complex ecological history I shared, there are these complex social histories that have influenced outcomes and trajectories of mycology and sort of you could argue rendered it this somewhat marginalized science that suffers from a lack of funding, a, a you know sort of paucity of programs um, and a few um, uh, just a general lack of public understanding. So the kingdom has been pretty persistently malign, maligned, feared, and misunderstood. And this has directly led to like a sabotage of scientific understanding for the last few hundred years in particular. And in Western Europe and the United States particularly, um, you know, people are raised to fear mushrooms and are, they're sort of unilaterally viewed as diseased and poisonous and just generally danger, dangerous. And we know that, you know, Ideally, science is this, in its ideal form, this equal opportunity investigative methodological tool, um, but 
historically modern science has been disproportionately written and um, informed by the perspectives of white men from Western Europe, um, often also Christians. Um, and this dominant lens and dominant cultural lens um, includes, um, sadly, not only heteronormativity, but racism and sexism, ableism, and the binary is sort of inherent to those things. And all of these have had direct impact on our, you know, our pursuit of science. So there's so many examples of this um, throughout the literature. And this is a poem from Emily Dickinson or a little clip of a poem from Emily Dickinson. And here she's comparing mushrooms to Judas Iscariot, the dis disciple who betrayed Jesus Christ to the chief priests and led to his crucifixion. So she's sort of suggesting here that there's this sanctity to nature that is defiled and betrayed by um, the mushroom. And it's sort of this like threat to a holy, holy place. Um, and actually later in the poem, she refers to mushrooms as the elf of plants, um, which sort of echoes the Linnaean um, title of fungi, which was lower plants um, in, you know, a teleological kind of understanding of, of fungi having like being le less evolved. And similarly, um, Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes has this passage and you can, I just bolded sort of the, some of the more, um, you know, mean <laughs> words, the sickly, festered, monstrous, foul postules, death, filthy, et cetera. Um, and this is, this language is, in, you know, using this kind of um, ableist and even queer phobic sentiment to um, basically describe this picture of mushrooms being dirty and foreign and frightening, um, despite rather than being these integral um, beings that are central to forest health um, and that you know maintain the nutrient cycle and enable all of the organisms that we love or that are more socially valuable to even exist. Um, so it, it suggests this like visceral sense of like wrong and mushrooms are somehow wrong. So in order to sort of understand how these perceptions arise, um, we need to take a step back and ask this very basic question, but one that I've noticed that not all scientists are very comfortable asking, some people get a little squirmy, um, but you know, the question is what is science? And um, science should be, as I said, an equal opportunity investigative methodological tool it is a it is a tool it is a way of uh, it's a way of gathering information and sharing that information as as standard uh, in a, as standardized a way as possible you can think of it as everything we need to know or want to know about the you know universe as in as infinite and this collective scientific incremental understanding of piecing these little things together is like each little discovery is infinity minus one. And it is a way of knowing, and that way of knowing is one of, of many. Um, and I think that um, science is, I'm a scientist, so this I just wanna make sure that none of this is interpreted as being anti-science, but um, it's tremendously powerful and valuable, and it allows for this you know, language of globalized participation in, in discovery. Um, and you know some of the hallmarks of science are replication and standardization, and that you know, that is for good reason. We want to be able to, um, you know, if anyone asks the same question, they should be able to arrive at the same conclusion if they use the same methods, and that that is um, kind of the principle, the fund fundamental principle. But um, I think that one, you know, and we I do want to differentiate between. Um, pseudoscience and alternative ways of knowing, um, because purporting to be science and failing to abide by the scientific method is fundamentally different than, you know, openly and explicitly operating outside the confines of the scientific method, and they should be regarded differently. Um, so pseudoscience can be really destructive because it's dishonest and it's sneaky um, and is rightfully criticized, but I think that there can be trouble or confusion that arises when replication and standard are actually conflated with knowledge itself or some ultimate sort of perception of truth. And that's where um, um, I think it's very important and powerful for scientists to be versed in, uh, in a philosophical understanding of what is knowledge and what is, what is truth. And this, you know, can go on for a while, but I think I'll I think that 
I'm just sort of trying to get, um, I talk about this more in depth in the paper, but. So part of understanding um, other alternative ways or knowing can, you know, you can turn to other um, cultures um, within and without Western culture, but um, like subgroups and, you know, um, traditional ecological knowledge. So this quote is from Tiakasin Ghost Horse, who is a scholar at Yale University, and he's also a member of the Lakota, uh, Cheyenne River Lakota Nation. Um, and he explores in his work, amongst other things, but relational and egalitarian thinking processes um, familiar to the Lakota people as compared to the rational and hierarchical thinking processes within Western cultures. Um, and Ghost Horse says that for Lakota people, language is inherently relational and all things are bound together. And this quote, I think, um, is quite powerful and it highlights um, particularly the word dom domination as one that doesn't exist in the Lakota kind of um, cosmology even, and but one that is so fundamental to sort of Western perspectives. So mycology is a science um, that I argue by its very nature challenges paradigms and deconstructs norms. And mycology disrupts our mostly binary conception of plants versus animals, um, two sex mating systems, and sort of this idea of the individual, like a discrete organismal structure, and calls upon um, multimodal ways of um, mul multimodal methodologies for knowledge acquisition. And Throughout mycology, you can, you will find that fungi tend to defy objectivity and standardization, and specifically the sporadic and ephemeral and you know very unpredictable appearances of fruiting bodies, the the, the mushroom, um, are really can really complicate mycologists' ability to obtain population data, um, and there are you know a number of complex abiotic and biotic forces that come together to um, generate fruiting in many cases. And in some fungi, such as the morels, um, you know, you might be able to find very consistently at the same, you know, several degree days after a certain point in the season at the same spot every year, you'll reliably find your morels. But then there's a number of many, many other species, such as the ascomycete um, inonomidotis, which is a very rare fungus um, and whose fruiting patterns are, or at no pattern even has been determined. Um, so it, it is very complicated when, st unlike, you know, finding a tree or even a, a moving mammal like a bird, um, these things really kind of defy our abilities in many ways to quantify them in a very universal way. Um, also, you, know, you get to the question of whether, you know, if you see a group of fungi fruiting in a certain area, say you approach a stump and it's full of honey mushrooms, maybe there's 100 honey mushrooms growing, do you count those as one individual, do you count them as 100 individuals, they may be genetically the same, there may be a mix of genetics in there, if you, you would have to perhaps sequence them all to figure out if they were truly, you know, unique, and that so they're actually, when, when doing surveys, there's not a universally applied answer to that question. Also, if the mycelium is present in this particular area, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the fungus could fruit if it, if it you know, if um, that was necessary. And um, we, we don't, as mycologists, quite understand um, if a fungus can be found in the soil, but it also produces fruiting bodies, is that the same as it, the fungus producing fruiting bodies in that area? Should it be counted the same way? All of these are questions that we, we really haven't um, gotten a, a clear universal answer on. So this lack of conformity to these kind of quantif quantifiable boxes has put fungi at a greater risk of extinction. Um, and, because, and that's somewhat because their biological realities aren't really necessarily given the right space or um, understanding in our conservation frameworks. Um, and I think I argue that it, we have to sort of as scientists, given the, the massive challenge that we face with climate change and these radical, the, you know, radical shifts in the earth, I, radical um, solutions aren't need to be, um, I guess, put forward to try to meet those demands. So we need to interrogate our sort of dualistic and sort of, uh, in some cases, hyper-quantified 
perspective on these organisms so that we can um, help understand them better and pr protect them in um, a conservation concept. So this is like a little photo of a mycelium growing on um, a petri dish. And for those, for those who don't know mycology as much, um, mycelium is the web-like network of fungal cells that extends apically through substrate and it performs sex and it seeks nutrients and builds multi-species and even multi-kingdom symbioses. Um, so in this sort of work, I'm trying to um, encourage this remediation of our relationships between fungi and, and basically all, all non-human organisms and thereby queerness by sort of um, collapsing the space that we have erected between ourselves and other organisms. And I, I kind of wanna do that by exploring more the dogma of institutional science, um, which I wanna differentiate between like science as a method and science as a kind of a cultural institution. Um, and as well as like the methodologies of mycology and give a, a basic background on queer theory. So um, the crux of the argument made here is that mycology is a queer science by virtue of its methodology and the qualities and characteristics of fungi. So I wanna take a quick look at the term queer and the contributions by the field of queer theory that are valuable lenses to apply to our understanding of uh, fungi and of science. So historically, the word queer was used to pejoratively describe non-heteronormative behaviors. And people now self-identify as queer to describe their existence outside of heteronormativity. So in the US, um, the word actually was reclaimed and gained popular usage during AIDS political activism in the 80s and 90s. And um, it was sort of this rallying cry um, which sought to unify subgroups that were not quite always captured by the terms gay or lesbian. Um, the word, um, so it kind of invokes this coalition of people bound together in their non-heteronormativity. So, and it, um, has, it has this sort of does, um, shared sense of belonging as central to the ethos. Um, and so people may identify as queer to describe homosexuality or gender nonconformity, transgender identity. And in all these cases, queer is sort of this like fluid and um, communal um, word that has this or history deeply rooted in defiance. And queer theory explores these deconstruct these con the constructed dichotomy of normative versus deviant and um, typically applied to sexuality and systems and frameworks that interact with sexuality, including race, nationality, and other identities. And this field grew from feminist and gay and lesbian studies, um, which focus on challenging sort of the quote unquote essential qualities of women and femininity, as well as the normativity of heterosexuality, which kind of becomes the unspoken and unnamed standard and expectation for romantic and sexual relationships. So, um, this work sort of interrogates the relationship between mycology and queerness by defining queer as non-heteronormative, um, non-heteronormative identities and expressions. Um, but there's also value in thinking more broadly of the term queer as referring to identities, bodies, and behaviors pushed towards the margins of Western, uh, Western life. Queer theory has drawn from a number of philosophers and theorists, including um, post-structuralists like Jacques Derrida. Um, and one of Derrida's contributions to the field um, of semiotics and linguistics is the concept of deconstruction, uh, which seeks to sort of deconstruct the idea that there are inherent and stable truths. And, and, it calls, and he calls an attention to the importance of language in the formation of truths um, and these sorts of, he attempts to probe the limits of socially ingrained concepts um, and uses de this deconstruction as an exercise of power and reshaping systems of power. So queer theory is interested in deconstructing heteronormative concepts such as the family as a procreative unit, definitionally, and sort of exposes fallacies and limitations of these expectations. Um, 
So queer ecology is an intervention specifically targeted against the institu institu um, institutionalization of heteronormative modes of scientific thought, which can kind of unravel this abounding queerness that is actually all around us, but we've been trained to understand as aberrations or sort of um, these exceptions to the rule. So alternative ways of knowing um, or knowledge acquisition have been historically delegitimized and erased throughout history. And um, so what gets taken for granted as being the truth of scientific endeavors is not always um, the full picture. So, you know, for example, in Western Europe, women had historically been the keepers of ecological knowledge, but their voices were excluded from formal participation in science, and their knowledge was often dismissed as folk tales, witchcraft, or old wives' tales. And those um, terms were meant to indicate that their knowledge was somehow fundamentally irrational or detached from um, sort of the reified institutions. And um, sometimes even their knowledge was deemed to be unnat unnatural or um, evil or otherworldly devilish um, and had no basis in reality. And that had a lot to do with the fact that women and women's knowledge was fundamentally threatening to institutions of knowledge creation. So women were very often banned from formal participation in science, as we all know. So. Um, also, fem there was this association with, between um, it's called like feminine closeness to nature, um, which was not considered a compliment. And instead, it was this assertion that women were um, did not possess sort of the rational or intellectual cap capacities of a, a, a man. Um, and um, men, in fact, ch like would channel untamed nature into reputable reified scientific knowledge. Um, so in that by that those ways science has been disproportionately influenced by men and um, religious ideology and discourse also would influence understandings of our relationships to other organisms and um, the distinctions sort of in, imparting these more binary distinctions between humans and non-humans. And um, actually amongst some biblical scholars, it is believed that the word dominion, thinking back also to um, the reference that Ghost Horse made to Tiakas and Ghost Horse made to the word domination. Um, some believe that it was a mistranslation and the original text used a word more closely synonymous with stewardship. Um, and in, indeed those words are pretty different. And it's through this translation that some Christians felt empowered to dominate and exploit the earth. Um, so all of these things I think are important to, to consider. The erasure of alternative knowledges was um, true of some of the enlightenment science and a lot of ways in which we, and, and in a lot of ways we can look to Linnaeus as doing a quite a disservice to the understanding of fungi. Um, many people think that, um, well, his basically, he failed to understand fungi in a way um, that is scientifically accurate in many regards. So he, he in, as I mentioned earlier, he referred to them as lower plants, which sort of um, inherently means that they're somehow less valuable and less evolved. And in a lot of ways, Linnaeus's work on taxonomy was organized around the pursuit of an inherent quality that differentiated rather than bound organisms into their own discrete taxonomic units. Um, and it is through that lens that we still sort of are approaching fungi. Um, so taxonomy, I'm, so I'm also a taxonomist and I care a lot about taxonomy actually, but um, taxonomy is a critical tool for use for understanding fungi, but it has also its limitations for, you know, tr fully understanding the scope of an organism. So along with the spread of institutional science, Christianity continued to spread. And part of that was through colonialism and um, the role of agriculture and, and its relationship to colonial pursuits. Um, so, you know, it's, it's well known that and documented that Christianity strongly influenced scientists like um, thinking about heliocentrism and evolution and the impact that it had on the church and, and, and its constituents. And then scientists like Descartes and Euler and Newton, they were often sort of loyal to the church in their supposedly objective pursuits of knowledge. Um, 
But the spread of large scale agriculture um, also interacted with science and Christianity with scientific discoveries enabling new and often ecologically harmful manipulations of land and crops. Um, science and with Christian domestic and marital structure was organized around like sort of in connection with agriculture and we in this paper termed this agro heterosexuality. So um, Christian thinkers often compared human sexual actions to planting a field and only those activities that corresponded to seeding or pro procreation were accepted as natural. Other activities impeding or ignoring reproduction, whether performed with members of the same or opposite sex were forbidden um, and kind of seen as being like against nature. So a body that performs these forbidden actions is itself sort of unnatural and defiant. And this is where queer sexuality meets queer ecology. So including how fungi are sort of defy these procreative, um, very neat procreative boxes. And in fact, how they directly are, were sort of seen as enemies to um, monoculture and expansive farming techniques. Anna Singh, um, the anthropologist, explores this in her work, Unruly Edge Edges, Mushrooms as Companion Species. And she writes about how the emergence of vast fields of grain offered fungal plant parasites a field day and a reputation as the enemy of civilization and later progress. And this is sort of an ironic uh, um, assessment um, or I should say this relationship is sort of ironic because when agriculture disrupts and strips bare natural ecologies, uh, the resulting monocultures are increasingly vulnerable to pests and pathogens, and some of these are fungal. Um, and this sort of notion of progress implies this forward movement, um, pro productivity and growth. And um, these are concepts which queer phobic discourse suggests become hindered through a lack of heterosexual uh, procreation. So science is like not um, inherently a, a capitalistic endeavor, but um, the discourse of progress and forward movement can strap these capitalistic notions towards scientific spaces and pursuits. And Singh, Anna Singh kind of further explores this idea, um, talking about the concept of scalability, this capitalistic drive to perpetually scale up and up and up. Um, and sometimes you know, not hetero, um, based, there are disruptive forces to that, such as queerness or in some pathogenic fungi, and these things um, are then sort of written as as enemies to civilize to civilization. And Anna Singh writes, I love this quote, um, biological and social diversity huddle defensively in neglected margins. Most everywhere a negative correlation exists between diversity and intensity of capital investment and state control. So she talks about how as cereal farming under capitalism intensified throughout Eurasia, families were expected to give a portion of their yields to the elites and um, mushrooms grew wild on these untended margins of these farms and were incorporated into people's diets sort of under the table. And um, they provided this form of nourishment that was outside the reach of the state. Um, so these sort of mushrooms and were these um, she says there are sites of indeterminate encounters with no prescribed measures for productivity or success, um, unlike the, um, the agricultural crops. So they're sort of like the anti-plantations, she says. So mycology is queer at the organismal level. Um, fungi are non-binary, they are neither plants nor animals, but they possess a mixture of qualities that are common in both groups, upending this sort of clean binary conception of nature that particularly non-scientists might subscribe to. Um, it's actually pretty rare for a fungus to have only two biological sexes, and some fungi such, such as the fungus that I featured on the cover slide, um, Schizophilum commune, has as many of 23,000 mating types. And, you know, when in, in many cases, when two compatible fungi meet, their mycelia will fuse into one body, sexually recombine, and then remain somatically or in, in one body. And, and then they um, continue to live and grow and explore their environment. Um, there's members of the phylum Glomera mycota, which are only known to be asexual. Um, fungi in the order Labolbinielles um, sometimes have distinct bodies for male and female reproductive structures or male and female, um, or they may be found in the same body or sometimes they can be both. Um, 
and mycology has queer investigators. Um, of the respondents to the Mycological Society of America 2018 survey, 12% of mycologists um, reported as being a member of the LGBTQIA community, which is three to four, to four times the national reporting average. Um, and I will, the caveat being that it, people do nationally maybe under report, but um, still it's three to four times the reporting average. Um, one will, and also when you go to mycological conferences, um, this is anecdotal, but um, I do, I would immediately notice when I began my PhD that it was a lot less formal than I expected. And it had the odd, the air of sort of this odd family reunion. Um, and mycology uh, is, I think, queer methodologically. So mycologists use sensing, intuition, experience, storytelling, and you have many mycological experts who operate outside of institutional affiliations um, more often than a lot of other fields. And for many mycologists, um, we have a, a somewhat um, emotional connection to our subjects that kind of extends beyond our scientific passion. So historically, or currently, um, whatever poisonous and degenerative qualities exist among a small subset of the kingdom become mapped onto the character of fungi as a whole. And this is sort of the consistent logic of um, sort of any type of reduction based on identity. Um, and, you know, just for example, plants, um, there are many very harmful plants to the, that you know, are poisonous to eat or to touch, but we still have a much more dynamic relationship with the kingdom of plants. Um, than pe the average person has with the kingdom of fungi. And I, I use the words kingdom um, just as it, loosely, I suppose. <laughs> so uh, actually, if, I guess um, in general, I want one thing I'm interested in studying and I've begun to study is collecting more data on this particular um, element. So I'm interested in studying sort of um, the sociology of different scientific disciplines. And um, there isn't a lot of data to compare this, um, the figures that I shared with you about mycology, like to say entomology, but that's something I'm very interested in. So, sorry, one second. Yeah, um, queer, so basically, oops, I wanna go back to this. Mm -mm. Departments, I don't, maybe you've noticed, but um, most departments that have mycology, they're housed, the, the um, study of mycology is housed within forest or plant pathology, pathology. That was true where I did my PhD at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and it's true where I'm doing my postdoc. Um, it's always a pathology department. Um, so this, this sort of like, in, you know, to this day, it's mostly true that if an institution even has a mycology lab and few do, um, it's mostly gonna be placed in this like department or sub department titled pathology. And that speaks to the scientific understanding of fungi, which has been sort of constrained by this, these social forces and confirmation bias. Fungi, it's, it's setting the stage for understanding that to the, it's setting the stage for approaching fungi through this lens of path pathologization and understanding them as something to be fought, controlled, or eliminated. And of course, these things are, um, fungi do cause harm to agriculture. They can be poisonous to people, et cetera, but um, that's not, most fungi, if they fill those roles at all, um, are, you know, not understood that, sorry, with mo few fungi fill that ro those roles at all. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Um, and so I'm not discrediting the research on those issues. That's completely important. I'm currently studying rust fungi, which are plant um, pathogens. And actually my PhD work was on the lab albinales, which are um, debatably parasites on insects. But, you know, there are so many fungi that are doing life-giving um, are involved in life-giving ecologies that are, you know, there, but still sort of under the umbrella of pathology. Um, this I'm actually going to, well, I'm, I know I'm a little short on time. Sometimes I give this talk and I go on for a lot longer. Um, so I'm, I want to be mindful of not going over, but um, I, I guess I will call attention to the fact that, um, you know, Debating the definite like species concepts is also can be its entire own talk. Um, but we do have, um, I, I just want to highlight that 
many fungi really are shifty when it comes to falling under a really concise species concept. Um, and, and it can shift depending on the objective of the investigator. So um, we have the phylogenetic or biological species concept might be true in certain contexts, but the ability to strictly define a species um, fundamentally doesn't always tell you everything you need to know about that species. And I think what um, I, the mycobiome is a great example of these critical interdependencies that are found all throughout nature and sort of, um, you know, take for example, like a, a yeast or a single celled fungus, it could be hardly be more morphologically or genetically distinct from a human body. And yet there's a suite of yeast found within our bodies um, that we depend on for basic bodily functions and are rarely found living outside of human bodies. And these Species are critically interdependent, but this understanding cannot be derived from species concepts. So if you, you simply knowing what a species is does not share necessarily the complexity of its life, right? So um, I think that that kind of uh, frame shift and understanding both, you, I think it's important to individually continue taxonomic work, but not, but also understand that um, no organism there like what is the relevance of an in uh, an organism in a vacuum um i think that needs to be like reflected upon so i do kind of have to skim a little bit through here um but i do want to mention the um also anthropologist donna haraway who's a really influential thinker in queer theory and and sort of um non-human relation, like um, basically kind of putting forward the value of non-human and or relationships between human and non-human. I like this quote a lot as well. Um, I'm not a post-humanist. I am who become with companion species, who in which make a mess out of categories and the making of kin and kind. Queer messmates in mortal play indeed. I think that's very beautiful. So, um, yeah, I don't have time to talk about this. Let's see. Anyway, I, I think there's so many more things to be said, but I you can read the paper if you're interested in getting really into the nitty gritty details. Um, but I do think that ultimately these issues around um, I, I are around mycology and its sort of marginalized status have a very serious impact, material impact on the state of the field. So for example, um, only about 120,000 fungi have been named out of the you know, upwards of 3.8 million species that are thought to perhaps exist. And I think that that um, really speaks to the, the task at hand and how many, and, and of course, um, in the throes of the sixth um, mass, massive extinction event. Um, these species are likely going extinct before we'll ever get to even know that, that they exist. And I, I, I mean, that's true for other organisms as well, but the, um, it's incredibly true for fungi. Um, I do want to mention the thinker. I'm sort of skipping around a little bit, so I apologize, but I can't, I don't want to proceed without uh, or conclude without um, mentioning Dr. Robin Kimmerer, who is a professor at ESF and um, was on my committee. And also she's an, um, a brilliant writer and thinker. She's an indigenous woman who writes on the subject of traditional ecological knowledge. And she um, describes the, um, she introduces the Potawatomi word papawi, um, the force which causes mushrooms to push up from the earth. Um, and this language, this, she writes about how this word, no, she was shocked when she encountered this word because no similar word exists in the English language or, and she would think, you would think that biologists of all people, she writes, would have the language for expressing such um, subtle detail. And, in, but in fact, we, we don't, we actually, English language speakers and um, scientists actually are not the best at, at sort of describing these more animate, um, less concrete, elements of life. And she argues that that leads towards a sort of um, disconnect with the natural world um, and a sort of over and over reliance on things that have already been named and understood um, for fear of being, I guess, ridiculed or for fear of being called irrational. Um, but it is through, you know, alternative epistemologies that um, science can make tremendous gain. Thomas Kuhn talks about um, the, you know, the paradigm of a science revolution um, is when you, you know, challenge um, 
the dominant knowledge structure with alternative epistemologies. And I think that that is something that scientists should be a little bit more flexible, um, a little bit more willing to um, at least grapple with, even if it, if not, you know, necessarily in their publications, but in their in their classrooms and in their in their um, ex exploration in general. So, I can't. I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm just going to go to the put up my last few slides. Um, and I do want to end on this sort of hopeful note of just as fungi are capable of reclaiming land bodies and nutrients, um, we too can reclaim our relationship with fungi as our ecological siblings and um, we can steward their land, um, protect their bodies and just as they can steward our land and protect our bodies. So I think as scientists, we do need to challenge heterosexism capitalism, racism, sexism, ableism, and all these inequalities. Um, and recognize that science has been, um, I can, it has been instrumental in challenging those um, dominant worldviews, but also it has been sort of deviously employed at its service, such as like in the case of eugenics. Um, so I think it's really important that scientists are both science positive, but science critical, as I mentioned before, and can, um, you know, navigate intellectually these, um, these challenges. So um, again, if you want to read more about the sort of details of these concepts, I, I invite you to read the paper. And um, thank you so much for coming and for listening. And I'm very grateful for your, for your time. So thank you. Yes, th thank you so much for that. Yeah, for that really amazing talk. And, and I'm excited for the Q&A. And for, for me, your, your work really pushes and challenges how I think as a scientist, um, which I'm really grateful for. Um, so thank you again. <laughs> All right. So um, as I mentioned before the talk, we're going to start the Q&A session by breaking out into breakout rooms for 10 minutes. Um, and this is an opportunity for you to share and peer review any questions that um, or reactions that you might have had to the talk um, and, and as a way to create a positive and constructive experience once we come back together as a larger group. And in doing this, I'd like for you all to consider three things. So um, first, um, in your breakout groups, um, is your question really a question? Um, second, does the question need to be posed and answered in front of everyone? And third, remember that um, Patty's already done a lot of work for us. So use the time in the breakout room to figure out if your question is asking her to do work um, for you that you should actually be doing yourself. So after 10 minutes, we will come back together for a moderated Q&A. And as moderator, I will um, try my best to prioritize questions from um, undergrads and grad students and early career researchers. And it seems like there are a lot of early career scientists in the um, um, here, which is really amazing. Um, so yeah, um, you'll be you can ask your question either through the raise hand function or by typing it into the chat. And if you type in your question through the chat, I'd ask that you just share your career stage as a way to help me moderate the Q and A. Um, so if you're a grad student, just type grad and then your question. All right, so let's split into breakout rooms. And even if you don't have a question for Patty, I'd encourage you to please join the breakout rooms um, to help those um, with questions peer review them. So, all right, I'm gonna set this up. Um, we're going to do, let's do, all right, I'm opening all the rooms and I will see you all back here in about 10. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, hopefully I didn't it, um, bring people back and interrupt um, any conversation that was happening. Um, yeah, so I see, yeah, Patty, you are back. Are, are we ready? Yes. All right, so let's, um, you can either type your questions. If you have any questions for Patty, um, you can type them in the chat and I can read them out or um, through your raised hand or through the raised hand function, I can call on you. However, um, you all would like to um, 
ask your question is fine with me. All right, so I see Morgan. Yeah, you can pop on. Thanks, Shane. And thanks, Patty. That was a really fun talk. I really wish that more of our seminars were like this. Thanks. Uh, so in our group, we were really interested in uh, alternative epistemologies as um, a basis for creating um, a kind of a roadmap to how we can simultaneously decolonize the science as an institution that we exist in and also create um, a more queer environment um, and make this part of our common language because there's also a lot of talk about how language doesn't encompass all of these complexities of life such as in mycology. So we were wondering if you could comment more on how to use alternative epistemologies in other fields. Like, do you see this happening in other fields? How could we leverage this? Do you see that as a possible way forward at all? Um, yeah, any thoughts you have on that? So I guess, I mean, I, when I'm thinking of like, so there's a few examples in the history of mycology about where there were alternative hypotheses put forward that were very um, criti like highly criticized at the time. So such as like usual um, hypotheses around lichens being these symbiotic organisms, uh, you know, a relationship between algae and fungi and um, also with mutualisms in general. So like around sort of the, the Pre, like the prevalence in the meaning of mycorrhizae and um, so um, A.B. Frank putting forward sort of early ideas around mutualisms in Western scientific discipline and then um, Schwendener sort of exploring the um, one of the early explorers of the idea of um, lichens as, as um, symbioses and both of these things were met with like fierce resistance and actually um, James Trappy, um, a, micro, um, a mycologist who works a lot with mycorrhizae, has written about how those, uh, like the acceptance of those, um, front, like those, I guess, alternative epistemologies kind of gained and lost traction following trends and sort of cultural zeitgeist, you know, like kind of whatever's going on at the time. Um, and, but still they've been like, kind of been slow to be like more broadly incorporated outside of mycology. Like under, I think mycologists are fairly um, tuned into the fact that there are, you know, there's like an organism doesn't exist in a vacuum um, because so many fungi are in community with other organisms, but other disciplines I think are a little more resistant. I've noticed this a lot in talking to botanists. Um, there's like a clear, I mean, you can argue that I have a fungal bias, right? But there's like a clear, um, I guess, sort of, I've no, again, this is anecdotal, right? But I have experienced people talking about fungi very in this very secondary way, even though the, the, the plant that they're referring to like simply couldn't exist without the fungal dimension. Um, so even the idea that like anything is not a mutualism or not a symbiosis is sort of, um, I think that's like a frame shift. So um, I'm trying to, I'm kind of meandering here, <laughs> but so you're asking about how to like, maybe just sort of encourage, um, I, I guess being more like accepting or more um, curious about um, new ways of thinking. Is that sort of maybe your question? Yeah, is that something that you see as a, as a good option for other disciplines? Is that something that you yeah, think I, other disciplines should explore? 
I think so. I mean, of course, as a scientist, like I understand sort of this like conservative element to our discipline, right? I understand that you can't just be out there making all sorts of claims. Um, I like, I, I re respect and appreciate the scientific method, right? But I do think that it can, you can follow the method into, you can corner yourself with it. And I do think that, um, it, particularly when you're resting on a bedrock of data that has been accumulated under uninterrogated years of particular people asking particular questions. So I think that um, it's, I do, I would, I don't, I don't really have a, a, a solution as to how to do it. I just think that people should, I think people should be in science studying philosophy of science. I think that people should be taking courses on or, you know, reading books or, you know, at least having dialogue about traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and I think that that would kind of being sort of pushed and challenged to reckon with like, why do you know, like, how do you know what you know? Why do you um, think that that is the final word? And can you bring that into your own scientific practice? So I think it is sort of something that um, people should be like scientists in training should be encouraged to do as part of their education as scientists. No that gets at what you're Yeah, saying. I think the, the last part, especially encouraging scientists to do that work um, is something that's very tangible that we can yeah. all we can all start with. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure, thank you for coming. All right, so uh, a question in from Teresa Pagan on the in the chat. So it's really interesting to think about how assumptions of individuality can bias or hinder biodiversity survey efforts for taxa like fungi. Um, do you have ideas of alternative ways of surveying fungal biodiversity and are there advantages of alternative methods for taxa beyond fungi? Hmm. So I think that, I mean, I, well, thank, for, thank you for the question. Um, I was part of a research group, um, a National Geographic Explorers grant in Ecuador to go to this like um, place in the Andes that's under threat by a mining company. And we are with, it was a team of biologists from different organisms and um, the, our, my, the mycology group, we were um, trying to develop our methodology and we were talking with the botanists and they always wanted to run tra transects and do gentry plots. And um, that's sort of the norm. It's very well established in the field. And when we were, we kept feeling too restricted by that, we were like going out and we would just kind of be like, I think there's going to be a lot of fungi over here based on my sort of kind of lifelong um, study of landscape and feeling of like where you might find fungi. Um, and then, you know, the transects just felt like they weren't um, telling enough because, I, I, you know, and, and we, so it was actually interesting to compare like how, how clear cut the methodologies were for the botanists. They had a, a troves of literature upon which they were basing their, their methodology and the mycologists were all like, well, some people do it like this, some people do it like that. I like to do timed wanders where you kind of, I mean, I know that some botanists do that as well, but um, where, you know, it's actually very common that mycologists will do a timed wander where you just one, you know, and that, that in and of itself is not, you know, very um, replicable, uh, but it is maybe the best way to find those fungi. So that's sort of a non-quantifiable sort of methodology. Um, also, we use like taste and smell and all sorts of other, you know, like, you know, I just think about how just making my students taste different rushulas um, and making them spit it out also, but um, to just distinguish between the different species was like, is like a thing I like to do when I teach this summer class in the Adirondacks. So there's all these different like ways in which that you or I, mycologists engage with mushrooms to get information that is that is more like intimate or more based on sort of this like feeling that it wouldn't be as easy to describe or write you know very clean cut methodologies on. Um, but I think that that should be encouraged, and that I don't think that that I think that that's just how you will learn more about fungi as opposed to just insisting that there's like you should only do a transect to to survey an area or something like that. Um, I mean, I would imagine that other organisms, I mean, maybe this is cheating to say like slime molds <laughs> or uh, would also fall into this category, but, you know, I do think that not other, you know, animals, 
not so, you know, things that are, I guess, are like single cellular um, or just living within other organisms. Maybe you could even talk about like parasites um, being sort of, I just defying, I guess, clear cut ways of information gathering. Um, again, I'm meandering. So maybe if you just to re-summarize the question. Um, so hindering bio, let me just reading it again in the chat. So do you have ideas of alternative ways of serving fungal bio biodiversity? Um, so yeah, I just, I would say that I think it, it's okay. I think we, the main point is that we need to find out as much as possible before you know, everything goes extinct. So if, if it's not cleanly replicable, I don't think that that is bad for mycology. I think that's mainly the point. All right, so an, another question coming in from um, a recent PhD grad, um, Jillian Myers, mm -hmm. and with an ill-informed career trajectory question. So can you talk about both the wonderful and the challenging parts of bridging social and biological sciences so in your work thanks jillian um so i was briefly in a breakout room with a few people and um we were talking i we kind of touched on that challenge specifically so um it is uncommon i think for interdisciplinary work in general but i think it's particularly uncommon for someone trained in science to try to kind of step into the, the realms of social um, science and so trained in natural science to step into social science. Um, and yeah, I think that um, it's very rewarding in that I think that there's actually a quite a bit of appetite for it. I think people, I think a lot of academics are naturally curious people who, um, who, you know, love their, the, you know, whatever subfield they're in, but also have questions about the broader world. So I don't find it hard to find people to, to talk to about this. However, um, I do find it challenging to, um, I think you're, when you're striking out on your own a little bit and you're trying to put, put out an idea that is somewhat pushing the envelope, it can be a little scary. You can open yourself up to criticism. I was saying that I have, um, I think many of us academics have this feeling of like, you can't say anything that you can't have, you don't have like a million citations for, or particularly as a scientist, I feel that way. Um, so there's this sort of vulnerability in like making an assertion um, that is not like super well established and that could leave you open to criticisms like that you're just, you know, not rigorous or that you're not, um, you know, or especially now I think the climate, um, there's a lot of anti-intellectualism, anti-science rhetoric. And so I do fear that things that I say could be taken out of context and in bad faith, like interpreted as being like against science or something like that. So that's sort of a, I always want to be um, understood, you know, so that that can be challenging because you're trying to speak kind of like two different languages at once. Um, and so there's a lot of ground for misinterpretation. Um, but I, I think mostly it's been uh, fun to like, for me, I like exploring idea, I, I, you know, science writing can be so linear and so specific and it can be kind of, it was kind of fun for me to explore this idea and like kind of allow ideas to flow a little bit more, more freely. Um, so I don't know if it will get me a job or something, but I don't know how it will advance my career in mycology, but I don't, that was not really the point. It was more just to try to, um, I think, it, do work to um, advocate for concepts that I think are really important within STEM and within in academia. Um, so yeah, I think that that's it. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for sharing that answer with us all. Um, yeah, it gives, and it gives me a lot, a lot to think about uh, <laughs> as well. Um, all right, so we have, we have another question from um, Chetura, a, a grad student in EB. Um, so do you think the way forward for breaking away from the heteronormative methodologies and also language is by changing school curricula so that we can change the way we are conditioned to think um, and making fluidity slash queerness the new normal? And in what ways do you think we can resist the resistance that this will face? Hmm. Okay, let me process that. Hmm. 
Um, so I definitely think that um, it would be great to have, I think one of the things that I, I always circle back to that is not taught in an explicit way, certainly not in for children, but, um, but just like what is power, right? Um, and understand, and I think there, I've, I actually, it's, it's been a loose thought in my head for many years now, but I think I actually might be fun to try to like force myself to articulate it more in it right now. <laughs> um, but I think that you could scale age appropriate lessons to understanding like systems of power, even starting it for children. Um, and just sort of, I think the lens through which you can understand almost um, Discri discrimination and evil, or even evil, or um, you know, anything from a large like atrocity to just sort of microaggressions um, have to do with it. All comes back to, to power, right? And how does power shape um, just the very like language we use and the what we know as true? Um, so I do think that starting you know in curricula at starting for children I think it would be really powerful <laughs> pun, pun not intended actually um to uh, to just be understand like what is power and how does it affect your your world view um and I think that could be something that certainly I think at the college level would be easy to incorporate in terms of understanding um, how systems of thought become dominant and how others are relegated to the margins. So I think for sure, starting in you know, school curricula could, could adopt um, more courses on ethics, philosophy of science again, and sort of um, understanding, um, I guess it sort of concepts around deconstruction, like what is normal and why, who gets to tell the story, um, why are certain stories prioritized over others? And all of these things, uh, I think, crop up in our daily lives as well as in our scientific disciplines. Um, so I think that there should be, I don't know that queerness needs, to, I, I, I mean, I guess I have some resistance to the word normal, right? Because you don't want, there are, um, to normalize something might kind of um, come at the expense of something else. So I, I guess, I think it just needs to be accepted um, that fluidity and queerness is essential, an essential part of life in many, at many areas or at many, um, I guess, levels of organization. So understanding that I think is also, um, I think this, we should resist this notion of like the individual, right? That I think collective, I, I think, I mean, even just going through this pandemic, I think it's left people really grappling with this idea that, you know, no one really is a silo or no one is an island. And um, I think there's sort of this moment that's pretty ripe for conversations around um, our inter like interdependence as human beings, but also with other organisms. So um, I think normalizing that, or yeah, I guess normalizing, but making, ma accepting that um, is, I, uh, I think, a really important part of moving forward. So both just sort of rejecting this, the sort of neoliberal conception of the, ind the individual agent who, you know, pulls themselves up by their bootstraps and who, you know, has ma is makes is their own self-made man. Like no, no one really is like that, right? Nothing, and no organism is either. So. I think just trying to do away with that notion would be powerful. Um, but yeah, I think it, for science majors, I think people should take classes in anthropology and sociology and ethics and stuff. Um, I'm really into like liberal arts education, but even if you go to a, if, even if you're doing a, um, a, like a BS or whatever as an undergrad, I think that um, you should just, I think it should be encouraged to take classes outside of that. Yeah. So before we go on to our question from Catherine, um, Jill said in, in the chat, fabulous talk, Patty, so validating in, in various ways. Thank you. And Teresa says, thanks. As you're talking, I realized that time wander um, is basically how many bird watching um, based surveys are done. Um, so Teresa's an ornithologist, um, as am I. Um, and you definitely find different species doing um, that than standardized transects. Interesting discussion. Um, all right, so C Catherine um, says, do you think that fungi in their defiance of norms 
and binary categories have been on the frontier of opening up more expansive concepts, um, for example, around gender, interdependence, um, for all the biodiversity. Um, great question. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I think that they are starting to be on the frontier um, because I think that there's so, there is a more, there is some popularity, fungi are gaining in popularity in the last few years, I've noticed um, a lot, um, many, mostly, I guess, in like this, the development of like more clubs and just, and there's just, it just seems to be becoming a little bit more popular. And I think it's kind of like I was saying earlier that um, there are like, you know, how like in the 1970s, ecology gained a lot of public traction and that was kind of in concert with um, the anti-war movement and civil rights and war on, um, resistance to the war on drugs and a lot of, and like the psychedelic movement I think that there was sort of a cultural moment for, you know, the Silent Spring and, and um, racial by racial Carson, and I think similarly right now there is like a, a appetite for um, mycology that's starting to like, it feels like it's everywhere for me because I'm like engrossed in it, but I don't, so I'm not sure if other people are picking up on it outside of mycology, but um, I think that similarly there's like a cultural moment for, you know, redefining our like what what we want our society to be like. And um, I think that fungi definitely are a great vehicle for exploring that and, and pushing um, our, I guess, expanding our knowledge and our appreciation for like other forms of life as well. That, um, and I think that, I think it could help serve um, biodiversity in general. So I, I mean, it, it, like there are examples of other organisms that are um, non, you know, non heteronormative that are, are, are that are actively, you know, like there's a lot of um, homosexuality in the animal kingdom, and it's arisen numerous times independently, and you know, there's all sorts of different kind of, you know, quote unquote unexpected or irregular things that are actually we're finding to be quite, quite common. Um, so I think that using fungi as like a vehicle for expanding our awareness of the natural world is definitely hap starting to happen. Um, but I don't think that I personally there don't think that it has like very a long history of that. I think that's more of a newer thing. So yeah, thank you. Sure, thanks. Well, as somebody who studies mammals, I um, have become extremely aware of the roles, the importance of fungi, especially in the, about the last decade. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of things like the popularity of the secret life of trees, you know, which so much of it was about mycelia. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that, you know, even in a first year seminar that I taught last fall, I was delighted to see that there were students coming in who were just thrilled to be wanting, wanting to write papers about fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So yeah. I thought I took that out as progress. <laughs> yes, I would agree. I think there's, I think that there's progress. I think it's a variety of factors. But I think it's just sort of, I think, I think there have been some really important contributions like The Secret Life of Trees and a few other people mm -hmm. um, writing on the subject. So I think that um, there's, based on their work and then based on just, I, I think just some, I think a cultural readiness to sort of embrace this sort of long disregarded group. Thank you. Thanks. So we have, I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, question, um, if anyone else has a lingering question hanging out there before we let Patty go, or we um, can, oops. Sorry, I'm really creepy right now. I'm in a conference room and the lights went out and I think <laughs> most of us know how, like, it won't come back on. Um, <laughs> this is a non-vetted question, but I hope that it will um, still fly. It's just something that is, um, I thought about a lot as I was reading the Catalyst article, and I was wondering if you could tell us like the story behind how this article came about and how you joined up with Hazmic Gun doing this um, this piece. Sure, um, thank you for reading it and for being here. Um, so I, um, Hazmic is a very good friend of mine. Um, we're both Armenian, so um, we bond over that. And um, also, she is, she studied um, gender, women and gender studies at Syracuse University. So we, we know each other from Syracuse uh, where I went to grad school. And um, 
I wanted when I when I started so I started to put my ideas down for this and I was doing I was organizing all my thoughts and then I decided that I wanted to have someone who had training in theory to help me. So I approached Hosmic and told her, I pitched her the idea and then she was very excited about it and um, jumped on board and wanted to write it with me. But I, I thought, so, um, you know, she, she's not a, she doesn't have any background in mycology but she's like um, enthusiastic about naturalism. And so this was something that she was really excited to kind of work on with me. So it is, yeah, it's not the most typical academic pair for writing something. Hosmic's not an academic. Um, she writes, she works for um, a, a center for um, helping survivors of domestic violence. And she's also an, um, uh, just a, a writer in general. She, so she would studied women and gender studies and I think creative writing. Um, so yeah, she, she, I just wanted to, I didn't want to make any like faux pas. I didn't want to like cite some, something silly or whatever in the theory world and just be like, oh, you know, I, so I wanted to have someone who kind of was a little bit more uh, familiar with like the, um, fundamental texts in, in the field. Um, and then was there a second part to that question? Was that... I don't remember. I'm sorry. No, that, that was pretty much it. I think just okay. like the, I, don't, I, I really like the idea of joining forces kind of outside oh, yeah. of scientific academia to pull these things together, these ideas together. So yeah, actually, so uh, a few people have commented on that and pointed it out as being kind of atypical. And I think it's sort of consistent with the message of the paper, which is that you don't have to go through. Um, I mean, yes, I, I do have a PhD, but you don't have to go through the proper channels to put out um, knowledge or to share, you know, intellectually. So um, I think that that is some, something we wanted to communicate through our shared authorship as well. So we had we had one more question come in if we have time. I think we have time for it and then um, we can call it. But this is from um, Catherine Brewer. Um, communicating queer or fluid concepts that diverge from the scaffolding most have learned um, in traditional environments formal lectures and tests is difficult. Is there a methodology or medium for conveying these ideas? Um, I'm curious about the need for field work, um, informal discussion, or art. Um, hmm. and, yeah. So let me process that. And Catherine, you're more than welcome to pop on too. And, and, um, Hmm. So um, I first would agree that yes, it, this is not like an easy task. Um, and a lot of the ways in which we evaluate students is um, based on very particular metrics. And obviously there's a lot of sense behind that. Um, but I do think that, you know, the more we understand like human development and our brains and psychology um, and the more uh, inclusive of a society um, we become particularly extending accommodations in academia and sort of being like more tolerant of um, neurodivergence and various learning methods. I think that we are be creating a classroom that is becoming a little bit less fixed, um, which is a good thing. Um, if our goal is to transfer knowledge effectively and to inspire, you know, the gr intellectual growth and creativity, then like there isn't a real reason that to, to defy the, you know, adapting our classroom environment is just reactive and um, not necessarily uh, better at achieving our aims. So people, you know, but I mean, to some extent, I understand, you know, I understand, you know, the basic concepts of grades and whatnot, but um, I do think like kind of a flexibility and like having a diversity of, of, of um, ways in which students can process their uh, learning like journey is, is really valuable. So I, I like the idea of interdisciplinary collaborations a lot. So I like the idea of combining um, discussions of social science, like political justice with um, ecology and, you know, gardening and with like, you know, I guess, you know, anti-capitalism um, or art, you know, using art to convey um, 
I, I think, you know, talking about, there's a, like a lot of really beautiful artwork going on with it, within, like in my, mycologically inspired. Um, I think that that's been really cool and getting people a, a way of like sort of accessing or um, communicating from science to the world outside. I think that scientists are not necessarily always very good at um, expressing our ideas and relying on art as an effective medium um, or can be an effective medium. And I think scientists should be, I think excited when artists pick up our, our work and try to like refashion it and get people talking about it. Um, so I think that there's a lot you, um, I do discuss a little bit more in the work, like the particulars of pedagogy and, um, you know, sort of the, the decentralizing of the, um, of knowledge dissemination. So like taking, um, I think mycological societies are a really good example of sort of these decentralized systems of, of knowledge where you can freely join and, or like for a nominal fee of like $10 a year or something, like join a mycological society and, and, and receive um, free information. Um, and the only requisite is your own sort of curiosity so though I think that um, those are really good examples of like sort of that is a sort of a feminist concept or is taking not learning outside of the classroom um, feminist theory concept. So mycological societies are like a great example of that. Um, so just I think in general time out for little kids free form time outside is like invaluable. Um, and I don't know, I think there's a lot you can kind of go on in a lot of different directions with this but those are just some kind of free form thoughts I have. Yeah, so so Patty, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure um, to hear about your work. And um, for those of us in the audience, if you wanna pop your, um, turn on your audio and maybe we can give Patty a, um, an applause. Um, <laughs> thank, you. Late. thank you so much. And, um, yeah, thank you all for attending today. Yeah, have a great rest of your day. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank thank you. I'm I'm glad we I'm really glad we could we could make this um make this happen and work.